Melkor, the original Dark Lord of Middle-earth. After sowing discord in the creation of the world, he goes on to wreak havoc upon its inhabitants. Today on Nerd of the Rings, we begin our look at the entire life of Tolkien's most evil and most powerful Dark Lord. When it comes to Morgoth, there's simply too much to cover in one of my normal videos. So this week, we'll cover his origins and early battles, and conclude next week with his later wars and downfall. In the beginning, Eru Iluvatar, the god of Tolkien's world, creates the Ainur, that is the Valar and the Maiar. Melkor is among the Valar, and the mightiest of them all. In his impatience to fill the void with created life, he searches throughout the void for the flame imperishable, the mysterious power of Eru that allows him to create and give life. Melkor is unable to locate the flame imperishable, as it is not located in the void, but with Eru himself. You're likely familiar with the other name for the flame imperishable, the secret fire, which Gandalf references during his fight with the Balrog. As Melkor wanders through the void, he comes to have ideas different than those of the other Ainur. He grows rebellious against Eru, and wishes to create life himself. Without the flame imperishable, however, he is unable to create life, but can merely corrupt and twist it, as we will see later. When it comes time for the creation of the universe, the Ainur make a great music. At this time, Melkor weaves his own thoughts into his song, which clashes with the theme of Iluvatar. This causes some of the Ainur around him to change their music to his. For a time, the theme of Iluvatar and the discord of Melkor battle one another. Eru smiles and sends forth a second theme. Most of the Ainur join this new theme, but Melkor opposes it even more violently with his discord. Finally, shocked at what they are witnessing, many of the Ainur stop singing and Melkor's discord gains the upper hand. Eru then begins a third theme, sweeter and more beautiful than the previous two. This theme cannot be beaten by Melkor. Still, he opposes the music of Eru. Finally, Eru stops the music completely with a single chord of his own, as we read in the Silmarillion. The music ceased. Then Iluvatar spoke, and he said, Mighty are the Ainur, and mightiest among them is Melkor, but that he may know, and all the Ainur, that I am Iluvatar, those things that ye have sung, I will show them forth, that ye may see what ye have done. And thou, Melkor, shalt see that no theme may be played that hath not its uttermost source in me, nor can any alter the music in my despite. For he that attempteth this shall prove but mine instrument in the devising of things more wonderful, which he himself hath not imagined. Melkor is shamed and angered by this rebuke, but hides his feelings. As the Ainur see the work of their song, Melkor is among those who beg Eru to allow them to enter Arda. Melkor pretends to have a desire to guide the world and its inhabitants for Eru's glory, but secretly, he desires to dominate Arda and its creatures, especially the forthcoming children of Iluvatar, that is, the elves and men. Along with the other Valar, Melkor enters Ea, the created universe, and makes his way to Arda, the world. After they arrive, Melkor drops his facade, declaring to the other Valar that he is now master of Arda. Manwe, who is Melkor's brother, fears that Melkor will attempt to disrupt their labors in Arda, and calls forth more Ainur to protect them. Melkor leaves, making his way to the remote regions of Ea. As the Valar work to form Arda, Melkor seeks to destroy or taint anything they create. He demolishes their mountains, raises their valleys, and spills their seas. Aule's works are among the most affected by Melkor's deeds. After uncounted battles and years pass, news reaches the Ainur, who remained with Eru. Hearing of the war, Tolkas, the most warlike of all the Valar, comes to Arda in the Valian year 1499. Melkor flees before the laughter and anger of Tulkas, escaping beyond the walls of night. From that moment on, he will forever possess a hatred of Tulkas. Now I want to give some context for how time is measured during this age of the Earth. Valian years equal just over nine and a half of our own years. 
So from the Valar arriving in Arda in Valian Year 1, to Melkor fleeing in Valian Year 1499, well over 14,000 years pass. As the remaining Valar work to restore Arda as best they can, Melkor dwells in the Outer Darkness. The Valar complete Arda and raise up two lamps which give the world light. They dwell in a land called Almaren. Unfortunately, Melkor's power earns him a following among some of the Maiar, which at this time likely includes Sauron. Some act as his spies, and eventually, he meets with them as the Valar hold a feast after completing their work. It is at this feast that Tolkas marries Nessa. As Nessa dances before the Valar, Tolkas falls into a peaceful sleep. Melkor, looking down in hatred, decides his time to strike has come. Melkor and his followers come over the walls of night, returning to Arda. He delves deep into the earth, creating the fortress of Utumno in the Iron Mountains of the north. Evil flows from the fortress. Death and illness strike at the vegetation of Arda. Animals fight and kill one another, and the Valar come to realize Melkor has returned. The Valar begin to search for Melkor's hiding place, but the future Dark Lord strikes first. He comes to Almaren and destroys the city and the two lamps. But Melkor assailed the lights of Iluin and Ormal and cast down their pillars and broke their lamps. In the overflow of the mighty pillars, lands were broken and seas arose in tumult. And when the lamps were spilled, destroying flame was poured out over the earth. And the shape of Arda and the symmetry of its waters and its lands was marred in that time so that the first designs of the Valar were never restored. As the world is filled with fire and water and chaos, Melkor escapes, returning to his fortress. The spring of Arda, what should have been a joyous occasion, ends in disaster, as the Valar must use all their power to hold the world together. With their home destroyed, the Valar travel across the sea and come to a new land, Amman. There, they build the city of Valmar and create new sources of light the two trees. This ushers in a new era for Arda, the years of the trees. These are measured in the same manner as Valian years, every year being nine and a half of our own. Once we make our way into the first, second, and third ages, the years of Middle-earth are equal to our own. With the Valar now across the sea, Melkor is relatively free to roam Middle-earth, though some among the Valar appear in Middle-earth to thwart him as they are able. One is Ulmo, who will come into play quite a bit during the First Age. Yavanna is also mentioned as taking action in Middle-earth, and Orome, the Huntsman, would ride throughout Middle-earth, delighting in hunting down and killing the monsters of Melkor. Believing the Valar might move against him, Melkor dwells in his fortress, building his strength and breeding monsters. He also gathers the Maiar who are loyal to him. These servants, cloaking themselves in shadow and flame, come to be known as Balrogs. During this time, he also constructs the Fortress of Angband, where he places his greatest servant, Sauron. In the Year of the Trees 1050, the first elves awake at Quivienen. While the hunter Orome comes across them, so does Melkor. He racks the elves with fear, killing or capturing many in his time. Through the torture of his captives and other foul works, it is believed Melkor creates the race of orcs. After the Valar discover the elves, Manwe concludes it is the will of Eru to reclaim the lands of Middle-earth from Melkor. The Valar come to Middle-earth in the Year of the Trees 1090 to do battle with Melkor. This massive War of the Gods begins with an army of the West confronting Melkor's forces in the northwest of Middle-earth. The entire region is ruined by the battle. The Valar are victorious in this first battle as the servants of Melkor retreat to Utumno. For the next two years, the Valar place guards in the land around the bay of Quivienen, protecting the elves who had first awakened there. The Valar lay siege to Melkor's fortress. From where they stand, far away from the conflict, the elves can see only fires in the north and feel a mighty shaking of the earth. Finally, in the year of the trees 1099, the Valar break the gates and roof of Atumno. Melkor hides in the deepest pits of his fortress, but Tulkas arrives and binds him in the chain Angainor, which Aule the smith had forged. 
While Otumno is destroyed in this final act, the Valar don't discover all the deepest, darkest places within. Sauron and many of the Balrogs manage to escape capture. In the aftermath of this long war, Middle-earth is changed. New mountain ranges are raised up, the Great Sea becomes larger, and new lands and waterways take shape. The Valar drew Melkor back to Valinor, bound hand and foot and blindfold, and he was brought to the Ring of Doom. There, he lay upon his face before the feet of Manwë, and sued for pardon. But his prayer was denied, and he was cast into prison in the fastness of Mandos, whence none can escape, neither Vala, nor Elf, nor mortal man. Vast and strong are those halls, and they were built in the west of the land of Amon. There was Melkor doomed to abide for three ages long, before his cause should be tried anew, or he should plead again for pardon. So Melkor is imprisoned within the halls of Mandos, roughly 2,850 years. All the while, he plots his revenge. As this time passes, many of the elves would come to dwell in Amon. This is a large topic in itself, so we'll cover it in a future video. After the Three Ages pass, Melkor is once again brought before his brother. Melkor bows down, prostrating himself once again before Manwë, begging for pardon. Manwë releases him from his captivity, much to the displeasure of Tulkas and Ulmo. The Valar decree that he will not return to Middle-earth, instead staying in Amon, where they can keep watch on him. In secret, Melkor begins working to corrupt the elves, for whom he holds a grudge, as it was for their safety that the Valar came to Middle-earth to overthrow him. As Melkor assesses the elves, he realizes the Vanyar, the elves that would forever dwell in Amon, do not trust him. The Teleri, who you may remember as being known for their shipbuilding, Melkor deems too weak to be effective in his plans. In the Noldor, however, he finds a curious people who are eager to learn from the Valar, even himself. In the Year of the Trees 1169, one among the Noldor is born who would be Melkor's most bitter enemy, but also his greatest tool for his evil purposes. Feanor, the creator of the Palantiri, and most importantly, the Silmarils. Three great gems which shone with the light of the two trees. Melkor begins to spread rumors throughout the Noldor. He tells of Middle-earth and its wide lands, realms they would be free to rule were it not for the Valar keeping them in Amon. This distrust of the Valar and desire to rule takes hold in the hearts of many of the Noldor, especially Feanor. Melkor sows even more discord within the House of Finwë between Feanor and his younger half-brother, Fingolfin. Manipulating Feanor's pride and quick temper, Melkor convinces Feanor that Fingolfin plans to usurp his place as their father's heir and take the Silmarils from him. After Feanor threatens to kill Fingolfin in 1490, the Valar banish him to Formenos, where he takes the Silmarils as well. In solidarity, Finwë also moves to Formenos to be with his son. Realizing that Melkor was pulling the strings in this feud, Tulkas goes to imprison him, but finds him gone. Two years of the trees later, Melkor reappears at Formenos, seeking to further influence Feanor. This time, however, Morgoth goes too far and Feanor recognizes Melkor for what he is. Feanor's heart was still bitter at his humiliation before Mandos, and he looked at Melkor in silence, pondering if indeed he might yet trust him so far as to aid him in his flight. And Melkor, seeing that Feanor wavered, and knowing that the Silmarils held his heart in thrall, said at the last, Here is a strong place, and well guarded. But think not that the Silmarils will lie safe in any treasury within the realm of the Valar. But his cunning overreached his aim, his words touched too deep, and awoke a fire more fierce than he designed. And Feanor looked upon Melkor with eyes that burned through his fair semblance, and pierced the cloaks of his mind, perceiving there his fierce lust for the Silmarils. Feanor slams the door in his face, and Melkor flees once again, making his way south to the Valley of Avatar. There he finds a mysterious dark spirit which takes the form of a giant spider, Ungoliant. Melkor promises her rich reward for her assistance, 
and she weaves a cloak of shadow around Melkor and herself to hide them in their travels. In 1495, the Valar seek reconciliation with the Noldor, and between Feanor and Fingolfin. They all assemble in Valmar. Meanwhile, Melkor and Ungoliant make their way to the Two Trees. And in that very hour, Melkor and Ungoliant came hastening over the fields of Valinor, as the shadow of a black cloud upon the wind fleets over the sunlit earth. And they came before the green mound, Ezelohar. Then the unlight of Ungoliant rose up even to the roots of the trees, and Melkor sprang upon the mound, and with his black spear he smote each tree to its core, wounded them deep, and their sap poured forth as if it were their blood, and was spilled upon the ground. But Ungoliant sucked it up, and going then from tree to tree, she set her black beak to their wounds, till they were drained, and the poison of death that was in her went into their tissues and withered them, root, branch, and leaf, and they died. The light of the trees extinguished, the world is once again plunged into darkness. After Ungoliant drinks the entirety of the wells of Varda, they go north to Formenos. There, Melkor kills Finwë and steals the Silmarils and other gems of Feanor. Ungoliant, who grows in size after consuming the sap of the two trees, flees with Melkor across the Helcaraxe and into Middle-earth. Once they arrive, Ungoliant, in her insatiable hunger, demands Melkor give her the treasure. Melkor, who is now very weak from his deeds, fears the monstrous spider. He gives her each of the gems of Feanor as she, in turn, consumes each one. She then demands the Silmarils, but Melkor refuses. Ungoliant uses her webs to trap the Vala and nearly devours him. Melkor gives a great cry which summons the Balrogs from Angband. With their whips, they drive away Ungoliant and return their master to what remains of his old fortress. There, Melkor sets the Silmarils in an iron crown, which from that moment onward, he will never willingly remove. This despite the fact that the crown is a great burden to him. Back in Amon, Feanor returns to Formenos to find his father slain and the Silmarils gone. Feanor curses Melkor and gives him a new name, which the elves and men will forever know him by, a name meaning black foe or dark tyrant. The Vala Melkor is now known as the Dark Lord Morgoth. As Feanor claims kingship of the Noldor and leads many to Middle-earth, Morgoth, in his fortress of Angband, the Silmarils upon his crown, declares himself king of all the world. For the next 600 years, the elves and Morgoth would be at war. Next Saturday, we'll conclude the story of Morgoth, including his centuries of war with the elves, downfall, and prophesied return. Be sure to hit subscribe so you don't miss it. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters, including Tom DeBombadil19, Sky Carcass, Salim Rahman, Jim Limber Davis, Smorzerk, Matt Schultz, and Zetrock. Thanks so much for watching and subscribing, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.